Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone, if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Tracy Jones on the podcast. She's coming to us fresh off of winning her pro card, where, I mean, she's only been in this sport for six weeks it took her. So we're going to have to talk about that because that is, you know, I've heard some stories about people getting their pro cards early, but hers might take the cake and that is awesome. And yeah, she's on here to just share her health and fitness journey and discuss all things health and fitness. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Tracy, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Well, I normally ask about the weather, but I'm not going to do that because it just it's too depressive for me, especially, you know, just it's it's triggering my winter flashbacks, basically. But to get things started, why don't you just give us your backstory on what inspired and motivated you to where you're at right now in bodybuilding? I actually competed in powerlifting for probably 10 to 12 years. And I was moving to the latter stages of my career. The sport was kind of going in a different direction and I wasn't really, really happy with the direction the sport was going. So I knew it was kind of my time to, you know, I'd done everything I wanted to do in the sport and I'd always wanted to, to bodybuild, but I, I had listened to some people years ago who said I really didn't have the frame for it and the shape for it and, you know, all the things that people say and, and I was so caught up in powerlifting, so consumed with the sport that I really didn't have time for it. So after retiring from powerlifting, I spent some time with a, um, a functional health coach, you know, getting hormones, you know, <laughs> blood work, everything lined out. And he recommended that I, you know, do a show. So after we worked together, I started working with um, Scooby Prep, you know, Jason, and we spent about a year just building the foundation and removing all the fluff <laughs> from my years of powerlifting and learning about the sport. And then this fall, he's, he said I was ready. So we started prep in December. I did my first show April the 8th. And six weeks later, uh, Junior USA is where I won my pro card and the overall. So it's been quite a, <laughs> quite a journey. And I mean, I've talked to quite a few powerlifters that go to bodybuilding or vice versa. The first off thing that I got to ask is the nutrition. What was that like making that adjustment from a powerlifting diet to a bodybuilding diet? Because they are vastly different. Well, not so much for me. Um, oh. I always stayed within a weight class. I competed um, in three different weight classes over the years. So I've always been a really clean clean eater. I've really always tracked nutrition, always been on top of that. Um, not to mention I've been a coach for probably 15 years as well. So that's just, that's not really been an issue for me. Um, but when I was retiring from powerlifting, I had some hormonal issues and put on, um, put on some weight that was really, really not moving, moving. So that was actually the challenging part was getting um, getting hormones lined out and learning how um, how to eat for bodybuilding. So I actually am eating more <laughs> more now than I was as a powerlifter. Um, that really wasn't the challenging part to me. Um, I think there are a lot of similarities. That's one of the pulls that I tell people when they talk about like getting in shape and stuff. It's like once you reach a certain level, you can eat more than you are even eating right now. Now, again, it's not going to be the junk food, but like still you can, you can put more stuff in, but so you're one of the few, cause we've had a few powerlifters that like, yeah, they still try to keep a diet, but then I've also talked to some of those powerlifters where they're like, give me 5,000 calories a day. I don't care. Just, just blow through it. But there's also a different mindset. I think when it comes to powerlifting than bodybuilding, because powerlifting, you're just, you know, it's, about, it's all about the lifts. It's all about the numbers and in bodybuilding. I mean, it's about a certain maybe muscle in your back that you might not be able to get, or it's a certain thing in your hamstring. Like it's so much more of a different mindset. What was that adjustment like? I think the biggest adjustment for me was, um, I love being strong. I mean, it's just something that becomes part of your identity after competing for a decade. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me was the shift between, um, numbers and like you said, just muscular development, you know, there's there's no asterisks by your name when you compete that says she squats this much or she deadlifts this much. It doesn't matter. So it really needed to learn to shift my mindset um, in the gym. That was that was the hardest part. Nutrition, cardio, I could do all of those things. I'm I'm a very disciplined person, but the hardest part was 
making that shift between what I want to do and what, like you said, what do I need to do? And you know, taking the feedback from my coach and moving, moving that direction was, that was the most difficult part by far for me. I've always thought that the tiebreaker should be if they're judging two people and they think they're exactly the same, how much the person can lift. And that should be the overall winner. Like in case of an extreme, like we literally can't judge this person apart. They just look too similar. Then you just go to how much can they lift? So that would at least be my two cents there. But I mean, a lot of people do start off in a healthy, you know, lifestyle that really get into bodybuilding, but you know, powerlifting too. There's just the little things that I love to bring up. I mean, I honestly, so this is a personal thing, but I just started smelling salt like literally like two weeks ago <laughs> because my brother bought it online. And then he's like, Hey, cause he was back home from California for a week. And he's like, Hey, try this. I accidentally put it way too close to my nose. And then I got like a full thing in it and I felt like it burned. So I bought one thing. I haven't, I've only done it one other time other than that, but I have it literally just in case I don't get a good night's sleep or anything like that. And I need to go to work and I'm just like, okay, just one for the road then and do, and do that. Because then as soon as we told our parents about that, my mom had to send us emails saying like, here's the dangers of smelling salt. Like if you do all that stuff and I'm just like, okay, we're not going to be doing it like every day or anything like that. But that was just my little, cause I've always told people that are powerful on the podcast that that was my on my bucket list is to do at least smelling salt once. And you know, I did it and it's, it does work everyone. Like there's no, people aren't lying. It really does get you going and stuff. But in the bodybuilding, like you said, it's just so much more of a, you know, muscle specific sport. But whenever someone first gets started working out, they always have that one body part that really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And they have that one body part that just drags behind that They have to train to oblivion. I mean, you already had a nice base with powerlifting, but what was one body part that really took off? And what's been one body part that you just had to drag behind? I had no idea um, how developed my glutes were because I had so much fat, <laughs> fat on my glutes. I always knew that my legs were always my moneymaker. You know, I was always um, a big squatter, a big deadlifter, but um, I really had to work on um, lat width, shoulder width, you know, balance, overall balance, which was to me was fun because it's always been about the training for me. Um, the show or the meet or what what have you has always been just the the cherry on top, I guess you could say. It's always just been about the training for me. That's the love of my life, just hard, intense training. So, and I'm waiting on feedback actually now from Junior USA's to see what direction we need to move going forward, you know, on the pro circuit. So we have some ideas of some things that probably don't need to grow anymore <laughs> and a few things we do need to bring up. But honestly, that's my favorite part. That's, this is, this is my favorite part, the, the working part, the part that's not, um, I guess, Instagram worthy, you know, when you're not shredded, lean bean, <laughs> shredded machine, when you're just working and growing, that's the best part for me. How different has the training been from powerlifting to bodybuilding? Because I've talked to some people who they still try to keep somewhat of a powerlifting regimen in there. And I've talked to other people where they just completely go full bodybuilding. Well, I did some things a little differently in, in powerlifting than some of the other lifters. I always kind of had a bit of a bodybuilding workout at the end of my powerlifting. That was something that was important to me. I always wanted to maximize my body composition in whatever weight class that I was in. So I always had, you know, my heavier lifts in the beginning and then a lot of hypertrophy, just general. What I didn't really see at that time was just bodybuilding. <laughs> so technically I've been bodybuilding for 10 or 15 years, but at the end of the workouts. But moving forward, for example, um, like I said, my glutes are kind of out of control <laughs> right now. So um, squats will no longer be at the beginning of the training sessions. They will be at the end when I'm completely fatigued. Um, probably no more deadlifting from the floor, which crushes my soul, at least at least for now. You know, some things like that were making adjustments. But I was able to train heavy throughout this entire six-month prep. That was just something we did. We made sure my, my food was a little higher, and we just had a higher output throughout the week, more cardio, more training. That's just the way I function. I'm a nervous worker, I guess, you know, you would say I would rather eat more and work more than the opposite. Well, one of the things that impresses me the most about the mentality of the sport is especially when someone's first starting a prep where you can do just as much as you're doing, let's say for the last three weeks of your prep as you do for the first three, but you're not going to see those changes really. It's just the body. It's like when you start to lose weight too. the first couple of weeks, you might not see that much just because your body's getting used to it. 
How did you deal with that part mentally when you weren't seeing the drastic changes when you're putting in just as much effort as you were maybe in the last three weeks of your prep? Because that can just be one of the many mind hurdles that you have to go through when you're a bodybuilder. I think the biggest thing is that you really need to have the trust with your coach um, and not um, backseat drive the entire experience. And I needed to work with someone who had um, had the experience behind the name that I could trust when he said, okay, we are on pace. Or when he said, okay, we need to, we need to work a little harder this week. We need to, you know, take it a little deeper. But I think honestly, my focus was always on one of my big goals is I'm searching for my hundred percent. That's, you know, that's when I'm in the gym, I'm always searching for my 100% effort. So I always focused on what can I control? You know, obviously, like you said, you can't control every week, you know, if your body's going to respond or if it's going to drop weight or if you're going to hold water, you can't control those things. You can mitigate them and control stress and sleep and, but you can control your effort in the gym. And that was where my focus was um, on the effort on the cardio, you know, effort in the gym. Am I checking all the boxes? So I just kind of obsessively checked the boxes every day and let my coach tell me where we were. And I think it was almost a benefit that I was so new to the sport. So I really didn't have a lot of expectations week to week. Like I probably will moving forward. You know, this is the way I looked eight weeks out. This is the way I looked 10 weeks out. I had no clue. You know, I had no clue what I should look like at any point in time. And to be honest with you, I didn't really even panic about that until the last two weeks when, you know, we were feeding into the show and I was like, I'm not ready. (laughs) I need to do more. But I think that really, you really just have to have a good coaching relationship where you can be coachable. I'd say like 75% of the people I've talked to, they tend to prefer actually like the three to four to even like six weeks out than the actual show, just because they feel that like they're a little bit healthier. Did you prefer that look more than the show look or did you prefer just the crazy, you know, I call it the skeleton face basically. (laughs) I honestly don't think I ever got that. Um, I think that we did things very conservatively and very health minded. Um, So I was really, I really didn't feel the prep fatigue until the last six weeks between, between shows, because I'm used to training hard. I'm used to peaking for powerlifting meets. I'm used to all this. So this, this was not a big deal for me. And we did not do any extreme protocols. We took a long prep. I think we prepped six months in total between the shows. So I was able to actually eat into um, both shows instead of being miserable. <laughs> you know, we cut in phases and had some maintenance phases. So I think that goes back to um, the coach and where you're starting, starting prep. Now, obviously moving into the pro league, um, conditioning is going to be a little bit different yep. moving forward, but I really enjoyed that part. I really, I loved it. I love it when you get close and your changes are from morning to evening. You can look like a completely different person. That's just, that's the best. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, speaking about conditioning and misery, they kind of go together when it comes to cardio, which I hate more than life itself. <laughs> Being, I hope that you weren't doing that much cardio when you were a power lifter, because if you were, you know, bless your soul. But what is your relationship like with cardio now? We're still seven days a week as we're easing, you know, easing, <laughs> easing out of it. But um, we've dramatically increased my food, you know, to get everything back online quickly. But it's it's not difficult. We're we're right now. I think we're seven days a week, half an hour, which is not not crazy. But I I don't mind it. I mean, I don't enjoy it. But I think that you have to love. You have to love it, even if if it sucks. I, I don't know. You have to love the process. If you don't love the process, you will never make it long term. If you're fixated on the reward, because you can't control what the what the outcome is going to be. You don't know who's going to show up at these shows. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, any number of things. But all you can control is your effort. And I wanted to know that when I stepped on stage, that I had done everything that I could possibly do. That no matter what the outcome was. And there's a satisfaction in knowing that I did the best that I could. I didn't cheat. I didn't cut corners. You know, I didn't skip out on cardio. I did have a cry on Mother's Day. That was the only day I cried on Mother's Day because I did not want to do any more cardio that day. So I had a little cry on Mother's Day. But other than that, I tried to stay focused on not having that embarrassing feeling because it's very similar to powerlifting. When you're on the platform, you're the only one that knows if you did everything you were supposed to do or not. 
and there's no one to blame. <laughs> it's just you. So I really, I really didn't mind the cardio, but we did, um, we did not do stairs, um, this cardio. So I think I was able to train a lot harder and it wasn't as miserable. So it's mostly elliptical and walking and, um, spin bike and some hip cardio, but I mean, when you're doing powerlifting, you are the center of attention when you go to your lifts, but it's completely different from stepping on a stage in a bikini and posing in front of people. What was that like getting yourself mentally prepared for that? Because that's a scary thing for so many people. I think that was my biggest weakness um, because I had no, no point of comparison. Like you said, of course, I'd been on some, some fairly large stages in powerlifting, but I wasn't in a thong (laughs) having to pose. So that was the biggest thing for me um, was learning to be confident within my posing. And I think that is only coming now over the last few months after months and months and months of just repetitive rehearsing. But that is something I do need to work on moving forward because we live in an area where um, there really, there really are no bodybuilders here. (laughs) So you're not going into the gym and seeing a dude in his posing, you know, trip posing trunks in front of the mirror. You're just not seeing that. So the only practice I had posing was in front of my, um, my posing coach. So that was probably the biggest, I guess, culture shock for me. (laughs) It was the first time stepping on stage and I'm like, Oh wow. Everyone is looking at me, (laughs) literally everyone. But I love the terror. I call it excitedly terrified. (laughs) That's pretty much the way it was. And I mean, just posing in general is something that so many people don't appreciate outside oh, the sport. They don't understand that it's the hardest thing for so many competitors. What yeah. was what was your experience like getting into posing and how did how did you make things somewhat easier? I honestly, I worked with Rachel Daniels and I cannot say enough good things about her because typically you see someone who's excellent in their their field and a lot of times they don't have patience with people who just suck. <laughs> you know, and, and when we started to work together, I think she was like, let me see your mandatories. And I was like, eh. <laughs> but um, she has um, the gift of coaching, not just the gift of posing and performing. And she was able to encourage me and give me, I'm not really a compliment sandwich kind of person. I'm just like, okay, tell me where I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible. Show me what to do. I'm going to work on it and we'll move forward. But I honestly cannot thank her enough for taking someone who I have no dance, dance background, no posing background, you know, no body control. I mean, when we first started posing, I was so exhausted because I was flexing so hard. (laughs) She's like, calm down. (laughs) But I honestly give her credit um, more than anything for just making it digestible, I think would be the right way to describe it. And just over and over and over and over again, repetitively practicing because I did not pick it up quickly. Um, I still have quite a bit to learn, but I think that's the joy of it. When you do something that, like you said, you're not naturally good at and you do it anyway. I mean, so many people do not get the whole being sore after posing and how for a lot of people, you are even more sore after posing than you are after working out. The body's not meant to be in that flex of a state for that longer period of time. It's just so many little things, but of the poses that you do, what is your favorite pose and what is your least favorite pose? I think my, um, my best pose is my back double by for sure is my, is my pose. Um, least favorite. I don't know. I really, the more I do it, I really love them all. Um, I think the least favorite for me is just the posing routine in general. That's just so foreign to me and so ungodly uncomfortable. <laughs> but that's probably the least favorite aspect of posing at all is the the posing routine because there's nowhere to hide. <laughs> it's just you. How different would you say your emotions are at a powerlifting meet as opposed to a bodybuilding show? I really had to change the way that I train and the um, the mentality that I used to train. Um, for years with powerlifting, I tapped into a very dark place. Um, that was just the way I connected. And it was a way that I could um, really shut off everything else and just get underneath a weight that could absolutely crush, <laughs> crush me. Um, but it was exhausting to stay in that mental mental space. 
and I learned in bodybuilding that I can't, I can't go there. You know, I can't go there. I really have to focus on execution and not going into a blind rage and just moving the weight. So I think bodybuilding was really good for me in that aspect. And it allowed me to shift the way that I train um, in a much more healthy and productive way. And let me know. And honestly, I'm just as strong, if not stronger now than I was when I was competing in powerlifting, which is bizarre, (laughs) really bizarre. How hard was it to let go of that sort of rage training, though? Because I know how effective that is for so many powerlifters that they live and die by it. It is, but I'm competitive. I'm a competitor at heart. And I knew if I wanted to win, then I was really going to have to face it. I was really going to have to face it and work through why I felt like I needed to tap into that place, why I needed to go there. And I realized that I could get into the same um, level of focus, but in a calmer way. So I had to change what type of music I listened to. I had to, that was a big trigger for me. There are certain songs that to this day I could hear and um, immediately go, go to this place. I got three of them um, myself. Yeah. I mean, there's some things I had to listen to and I really had to move. I mean, there's sometimes when I bodybuild, I'm just listening to podcasts or, you know, music that people would not, <laughs> not expect, but I had to change that. And I had to change, um, the people I trained with, you know what I mean? I had to change, change a lot of that, but that was good for me because it's not healthy. Like you said, it's not healthy to stay into, stay tapped into that, that dark, ragey, traumatic place. The only time I enjoy it is if I get it and then I know that I have to work out because I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be like one of the best workouts of my life, basically. And then you're just dead afterwards. Or like one time when I I normally go on walks at night, I ended up walking like 16 miles one night just because I was like really pissed off at something. So like that's the only time that I use it because that I know it's going to be like good. But otherwise, yeah, I do not. I do not recommend it. And I mean, you talked about the different group of people, the communities of powerlifting and bodybuilding. They're similar, but there's a lot of differences in them. What were some of the differences that you saw just as the community in general, the group of people? I think um, what was really strange for me was when I retired from powerlifting, uh, a lot of people thought that I was just done, (laughs) you know, that that was it for me. And um, I really had to just, you know, readjust, you know, socially to that. But I honestly can't say enough good things about the bodybuilding community in general, because there are people that um, were so kind that I've never even met in person that to answer my total get beginner questions, you know, (laughs) dumb things that, you know. Okay. That's like my first dozen podcasts on here. If you ever go back and listen to them, that's like me just finding out everything about that whole like stuff that I didn't know where you're, I'm just asking them questions basically. I didn't even know how to order a suit. I I knew nothing about what kind of suit that I should wear. I knew nothing about tanning. I knew nothing about any of these things. And I don't think the powerlifting community is quite so open in some of those areas, people are still kind of guarded. You know, nobody really wants to tell you um, anything that might give you an edge over them, you know, and that's just a generalization. Obviously you have some wonderful people in both sports, but I think I was just really surprised at how welcoming people were to someone who's completely new. And like I said, knew nothing (laughs) about the sport. That was great. I have heard similar things from some people that were just like you that went from power powerlifting to bodybuilding where they do talk about, you know, like how it's shocking. And I've always found that fascinating too. Cause I just, ah, the, all the people I talk to, it's kind of like, especially on the women's side, the men's side, it might be a little bit different where they're not as you know friendly to each other, but they're still friendly. But the women's side, it's kind of like a sisterhood where, you know, everyone tends to get along and everyone really supports each other. But you mentioned tan and, and good God, look at this skin of mine and you have pale skin as well. What was your experience like getting that tanner for the first time? <laughs> Honestly, well, to piggyback off of what you said about the um, the friendliness, I think a lot of it depends on the attitude that you go into it with. You know, I think some people go into it so competitive that you don't want to speak to anyone until it's over with. So I think a lot of it has to do with the way that you approach people. And that kind of goes from there. But yeah, tanning was an experience for me because I did not know that you would be naked in front of all of the people. <laughs> I did not know. <laughs> When I first learned that myself, I was like, wait, is that just like a scam? Is someone just trying to be a perv or something? And they're like, no, you actually do that. And I was like, wait, that's, I thought people were joking when they told me that first. But honestly, after, you know, I've only done two, two shows, but I cannot imagine having the days go the way they did without the people um, doing the tanning because especially like the liquid sun rays, 
phenomenal. I mean, they can make or break your day. I mean, they go above and beyond. They're there extremely early <laughs> until extremely late, and they're working constantly to make you have a good day. And I think that was the most amazing thing for me, seeing people um, really be so selfless and go above and beyond. They can really make or break your entire experience. I had I was not prepared for that, but I think those are the people that I was <laughs> I was the most um, pleased to spend time with was the tanning crew they're wonderful well yeah and i mean for me myself i just want to imagine how many coats i'm gonna get i don't even want to really picture it because it is way too many but you are in a very rare group like i said when we first started the podcast of people that win their pro card within their first year i've only probably talked to probably about half a dozen of them out of like the 500 guests the bodybuilding guests that i've had on Obviously, I'll have a video playing of you when you talk about it. You were shaking on stage when they announced your name. I would be shaking too myself, okay? I don't even know how you were still standing. But what was that moment like, you know, internally when they told you, when they called the second place name, and then you realized, wow, I won this and I have a pro card now? I didn't go into it with any kind of expectations. Obviously, I'm super competitive and I always want to win. But I, I never even attended a national show before. Never even been in the audience of a national show had no clue about anything. I did not know. It was I was first out on stage every time and I literally would have to ask the expediter where. <laughs> where do I go? What do I do? You know, even after I won my pro card and I was sobbing in the corner <laughs> off stage, the expediter was like, You need to stop crying because you have to go back out for the overall. And I was like, What's the overall? I didn't know anything about any of this. But to me it was like I said, it was the culmination of a decade of just brutal work. And in my mind, it was like a slideshow of all the successes and all the failures, everything that I'd been through to that day. I know it was a six week period with bodybuilding, but there was a lot behind behind those six weeks. And I think I just had such a massive appreciation. I was just honored to be there among those women. It was such an honor to be on a national stage. I, I just don't, I don't ever want to lose that. I don't want to ever lose that wonder and appreciation for the ability to do this because this is a gift. Like you said, it's a choice, you know, but it's a gift to be able to do this. And I, I, might, I knew my kids were watching on the live feed and I wanted them to see the cost of a dream. You know, we tell our kids that you can have anything, you can be anything, but we never really show them the distance between A and B. And my kids have seen it. They've they've watched. They've seen the things that no one else has seen, and they knew what this cost me. So knowing that they were watching me, and that they would never forget this moment, it was a lot. It was a lot in that little little clip. For well, sure. at least you had that background in powerlifting. Because had you told me that like just a year ago you started working out and then you win your pro card, I'd be like, okay, this is ridiculous. This is just <laughs> this is stupid. Because out of all, yeah, I've never had a guess like that. I'm waiting for that just genetically perfect person where you're just to be like, okay, train me once then. I'm because sure there. I'm I, I'm still searching for him. We, we you know we haven't found him yet. But does it ever annoy you how? the general public just doesn't understand how much work really goes into putting that package on stage. Because like I said, before we started recording, a lot of people just assume that it's just the working out and then the posing on stage. Whereas they don't see, like you said, they don't see like what your kids saw. They don't see like the, the crying on the treadmill or all that other stuff that happens, the diet, the sleep, everything. Do you feel that that's kind of just, I don't know. What's your opinion about like how people don't, cause a lot of people just assume stuff about stuff anyway, but a lot of times like, I would get frustrated just for the guests when they just, because people are just so short sighted and they just assume that, you know, it's just so easy that you just have to work out and step on stage. I think it saddens me. I see it on both sides, you know, as an athlete and I'm also a coach. Um, so I, I, it saddens me for the fact that I think a lot of women rob themselves of the joy of strength training because they feel it's so easy to just turn into Andrea Shaw. You know, you're going to trip and touch a 45 and all of a sudden, boom, you, you know, you're going to, grow a beard and turn it into a dude. And it really saddens me because I feel like a lot of women miss out on um, the joy of strength training and training hard, you know, not pink dumbbell booty bands training, but training hard because they feel like it is so easy to get shredded. And it really diminishes, like you said, the work and the absolutely brutal work that it takes to get there. But it really makes me sad on the coaching end. Um, 
because I see women who are so afraid that they don't allow themselves to pursue that. But I also have to understand living in this area, um, women don't look like me, (laughs) you know, so I get a lot of comments on both, both sides. So I think you have to also have to understand that we are a niche sport and it's not for everyone and everyone doesn't have to understand what you do um, in order for you to, to love it. But I wish more women would understand that um, you, you don't need to be afraid of strength training. Well, you brought up my next question perfectly because you are not the average looking woman. If you do walk out dressed the way you are right now, you are going to get people's attention. It's just human nature when you see something that's not of the normal to just just look. And it's I compare it to like being a mini celebrity. But how have you dealt with that? Because I bet you probably got some obviously as a power lifter, but probably not to this extreme. And how is it just is it getting easier for you to adjust to it? Or is it still something where you're like, okay, this is kind of weird. It's odd because I was larger as a power lifter, but I did not get the rude comments that I get, well, I, I got during prep, you know, the, the leaner I got when you start, <laughs> you start getting shredded and vascular. Um, I mean, sometimes it hurts, but I think a lot of it is people, people have never seen this before and it's different and you can't expect people to understand the unknown. So I try to be kind if people ask questions and answer questions, but there are days during prep when you know, you really just don't want someone to um, make fun of you in the grocery store, you know, but I think it's the price you pay for competing in the sport. You know, it just, it just is what it is. So I try to be understanding and answer questions as much as I can, but sometimes it stings, but that's part of being an athlete, you know, you take the good with the bad and try not to let yourself be moved either way. You know, whether someone's being complimentary or, you know, rude, you can't really give people power over your emotions in that way. You know, I mean, when I get comments about some of the guests, I always just assume that the person has like zero knowledge about anything because obviously then I'm just like, okay, they're just ill-informed, which is so many people because like, especially in this day and age, not too many people are, you know, into physical fitness, which is sad in and of itself. But I mean, you've never really, I'd, I'd assume you've never really gotten this lean down before. How did you deal with the mental side of things? Because I love to talk about prep brain. Cause to me, it's one of the most hilarious things out there. It's, it's not hilarious to the competitors, but to me, just as an outsider viewing, I'm like, okay, your brain just gets that foggy. But how, have, how did you deal with the whole mental process of, you know, leaning down and the fact that like, it is not fun for a lot of people. I did not see myself the way that I truly was until after the shows. Because I remember thinking, you know, like I said, the week out, I'm still not lean enough. You know, <laughs> I'm still not lean enough. And now I look back at pictures days out and I'm like, ah, <laughs> you, were, you were so lean. So I think you are, you know, when you're competitive like I am, it, it can kind of distort your, your view. But I loved it. I loved it so much. It was just really, it's different because with powerlifting, you can't always see the results of your work until me day bodybuilding you can see day by day by day and there's something amazing about that that I loved it but and I'm even enjoying this part where you're kind of going going in reverse you know because now is my favorite time actually this is my favorite part of bodybuilding it's not being in prep it's not the show it's the work it's the growth it's you know the off season when you can just train like a mania (laughs) that's just my favorite part but I think, honestly, I tried to just let my coach tell me where I was at because you have, you know, your friends are like, you are the best that's ever done it. You look amazing. And it's like you said, you know, people don't really know. So I really just tried to trust him and let him tell me where I needed to be. And also, like I said, I was so new. My first show, I had no idea how lean I needed to get. I didn't. I had no clue. We didn't even know what division I would end up in because we were so so new we weren't sure you know at a local show how it would do so were they thinking maybe that you might do physique then uh, or bodybuilding or yeah i did women's physique but and my the local show um the feedback was i needed to go bodybuilding and i didn't agree with that and my coach my coach didn't either and we were initially i signed up to do both for um junior usas but I was going to be the only um, female bodybuilding competitor. And I didn't know until I got there that they were giving out pro cards in every division except women's bodybuilding. So we were kind of like, why should I, you know, go out first? Because they they did it in 
kind of reverse order. Women's bodybuilding was going to be first and then physique. And we we're like, you know, why should we let the judges see you the first time in women's bodybuilding when they're not, you know, they're not giving out pro cards and bodybuilding. So we just really, um, we're waiting on feedback from the judges to kind of see what, um, what they think and where I should be. But I feel like women's physique is where, you know, where I belong. That's really, I would rather downsize to stay in women's physique than grow into women's bodybuilding. What was your meal that you had after you won your pro card? That's my favorite question to ask. <laughs> I, I was in Charleston, South Carolina. So we went to this place called Lewis barbecue, which was the best barbecue I've ever had in my entire life. But before we went to Lewis barbecue, I had four donuts in about 20 seconds. I think I can't tell you how it. honestly, how good does that taste? Cause I've never been that depleted and just realized, cause like I could imagine I could be eating broccoli then and it would taste I didn't amazing. Even taste it. Yeah. Didn't even taste it. Yeah. I had um, donuts delivered to the hotel <laughs> and I didn't even taste them. Didn't even taste it at all, but I didn't eat a lot. Honestly, um, I had that meal that night and then I had breakfast the next morning and then I was back on plan. I just, I really did not want to do this. I didn't want to mess up this part and just gain a bunch of fat and end up swollen and miserable. So. Yeah. And I mean, you are now a little fish in a big pond now that you're just got your pro card. I mean, like you said, it's a whole different thing now. What are your plans for, you know, like a year from now, where would you like to be at in a year? Well, we're going to spend the rest of this year, you know, and once we get the feedback, working on exactly what the judges want for me. And then we'll probably start um, competing in the pro shows in spring, you know, early in spring, just to get some experience and see, like you said, to see where I'm stacking up. Um, so this fall, we're going to do that. And I'm working on, you know, growing my business and, you know, taking care of my clients and, um, really trying to learn from the mistakes that I've made in the first, the first few shows, because I don't want to be one of these people who competes in a pro show just to do it. You know, I want, I don't want to be like, which one of these things is not like the other, you know, I really want to take the time so that when I step on stage in a pro show that I look like I belong there. When it comes to coaching, what is your favorite and least favorite thing about coaching? I honestly have coached a variety of people. I've coached um, college athletes. I've coached professional athletes. Um, I work as a certified functional health coach and have a degree in sports medicine, athletic training. I've worked in multiple different, um, different fields here, but the last few years, my heart has been with beginners. I feel like that is the most neglected group, the most taken advantage of group, the group that nobody really wants, you know, because it's not exactly high profile. You know, you not have people, you know, like um, Chris Bumstead on your roster, you know, to, to bring in other clients. But there's nothing like working with someone who really needs it and watching that light go on when they realize that they can do far more than they ever dreamed that they were capable of. So I have fallen in love with um, beginner clients. I work with um, power lifters. I work with veterans. I work with seniors. I work with beginners all over, but, um, out of every group I've ever worked with, I feel like I can make the most difference, um, with the beginners. I mean, I've always said the most inspirational person I've ever seen. There was a guy at my local gym. He's a veteran. He lost part of his leg and part of his arm in Iraq and he still works out. And every time I see him, it's just, I mean, it is so inspiring. And yeah, I honestly think beginners need to get way more attention myself because that's just, so many people take that first step in and then they just have one bad experience and then they just quit. Like it's, there's a lot to it, but I bet you've heard so many excuses as to why people can't get in shape. What is the most common excuse that you hear? I think people make excuses, but I don't think the excuse is actually ex the excuse. I think a lot of times that's a cover for what the truth really is. And I think the truth behind the excuse, the one that I see the most is that they don't believe that they're capable of change. They really don't believe it. And sometimes people just need just a little bit of encouragement. And um, they, need, they need to see that there's a plan. That there's a plan that I'm not asking you to go from zero to pro, that we're, we're going to build layers. We're going to build layers like a Lego, Lego tower. And they need to know that it's achievable. Um, so that they can start stacking wins and then build a little bit of confidence. But you hear excuses, but 
I never really believe the excuses. The excuses are just to cover. Most people just don't believe that they can do it. It just looks too overwhelming, you know, for them. So you have to really break it into bite-sized pieces and let them start to feel some success. And then subsequently they'll learn to believe in a little bit more. But the thing I've also noticed is once you get past that hurdle, the next hurdle is self-sabotage. Once they start to see results, you really have to watch out for the self-sabotage kicking in. So honestly, it's the psychology behind the excuses more than it is the excuses because a lot of times that's just the cover. You know, I'm sure you hear it. I can't do it. It's too hard. I don't have time. (laughs) You know, all the things. But most of the people just don't believe that they can, that they can change, that they've been this way for so long that they just don't see a way out. That's why I love, and I'm very sad for whenever I see someone in that beginner gain phase where they're all confident and they're all checking, and I just want to walk up to them and say, enjoy it while it lasts because you'll never be this happy with yourself ever again. So just enjoy it. But yeah, I mean, just the confidence level of people is just so ridiculously low that I found out where people just don't have that thing. And I, yeah, I don't know how I can inspire people, but you know, it's just, that is a huge thing that I see in my gym as well, where people just don't think that they can do stuff. And one of the bigger ones too, is that they think that everyone's watching at the gym when I have to, I have to point out to them, trust me, no one knows who you are. No one cares who you are. Everyone's so focusing on them, on themselves, but there's so much work to be done when it comes to, you know, training people and, and getting people in shape because it's, it's getting bad around here. People are so critical on social media. If a beginner posts a video of anything, you've got 30,000 people telling them all the reasons why their technique is wrong or this isn't the best way to do it or you're going to, you know, you're going to snap your spine or whatever. And it really discourages people, you know. So I'm very careful how much I post about my clients. I'm very protective of my clients and um, their privacy just because when you start building that confidence, like you said, it's very fragile. I mean, one of the things that makes me angrier than anything else is like, if you see someone who may be very out of shape, like maybe on a run or something, and then some buddy of yours might make a comment. You're just like, you never make fun of someone who's trying to better themselves. Like it's not, first of all, never make fun of anyone in, you know, I have to say that, but you know, like you never, never make fun of anyone in general, but like, especially someone who's trying to better themselves. Like you never, that's the one area that, you know, makes me mad myself. But a question that I love to ask every guest as we get close to wrapping things up here is, I mean, if you could change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it, what would be one thing that you'd like to see changed? I think the thing that I'm a little bit concerned about, I think um, men's physique, they, they've said this week that they're going to be changing, so they're going to have weight classes. Um, and there's a discussion I've seen you know, on social media today, should we do this for women's physique? And I'm looking at this from a powerlifting background because obviously we have weight classes and powerlifting and you have 24 hour weigh-ins. And I think that that's a dangerous road to go down because you're going to have people, especially women who are determined to stay in women's physique, for example, because there aren't as many bodybuilding shows, um, not as much money, you know, yada, yada. And knowing what people have done in order to make weight for powerlifting, um, Multiply this, that by 10 for bodybuilding. Yeah. yeah. And this is, like you said, it's not an extremely depleted state. Um, you're going to see some terrible, terrible things. Um, I think there's women's physique, men's physique. It should be a look, not a weight, because, you know, someone who's 5'2 is going to weigh vastly different than someone who's 6'2. I just, I'm real, that concerns me more than anything because I know, um, especially when there's money on the line. People are going to do whatever they need to do to stay in the weight class. And I think that they're not considering the health implications, you know, with that. Being 6'3 myself, I've always said height classes should be a thing, but no, not to weight. Just for your point exactly, like you could have said it by myself because for me, like, yeah, if you're 5'2 and then a 6'2 person, it's hard to judge. Like, it's hard to judge them together. It's just different body types. But I've always had a soft spot for the taller guests on the podcast being my height myself. I, I, I'm i going to lie. I'm a little biased on I'm not going to lie. I'm a little biased on that. But, yeah, the weight class thing is, is ridiculous. And to me, honestly, like, the whole money thing, too, where it's like these athletes should be making money. They shouldn't be spending money or losing money doing this because it's hard enough as it is. So if they could find any way to, you know, do that as well. But tattoos fascinate me. I'm going to be completely honest. And we can see your entire side right there is tattoos. If if it's if it's appropriate, what's the meaning of the tattoos? Honestly, this one um, was one that I let um, the guy just have free reign. I told him what was meaningful to me, and he put it together in a cohesive, <laughs> a cohesive way. 
Um, so this one is really um, personal to me. It's just a history and personal history um, for me. And it's also a reminder that time is running out, that you, whatever you're going to do in this life, you better do it because <laughs> you have one chance to do anything you want to do, to achieve anything you want to do. And you better get, you better get after it. So. And it looks amazing. I will say that I love the face and the trees and everything. It's really all, I mean, I've never gotten a tattoo myself. I plan, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'll ever get one just because I don't have any good ideas for a tattoo myself where I just, I would end up doing something stupid that then like five years later, I'd be like, why did I, why did I get that mess? It's not the whole tattoo, but it's the whole thing where I'd be like, okay, this means nothing to me five years later, like whatever I'd like have as a saying or something like that. So yeah, I had I, a cool one that one of my friends got is that they got, um, apparently the heartbeat of their newborn, they had it like on their bicep then and stuff like that. That's a popular one that I think a lot of people get, but yeah, I, I, I enjoy that one, but yeah. And I mean, out of all the advice that you give people, especially, you know, getting started and being a coach, I mean, what's the best piece of advice that you would give for someone who's just getting started? I think the best thing is to find, um, to find a coach that you can trust, um, not just for accountability, you know, accountability, of course, is, is wonderful, but someone who can help you navigate the experience because it's not just about eating a particular way or um, training a particular way. There are a lot of issues that you're going to face and, and when you're learning about yourself through this process. So it would be finding coach that you can trust and um, giving yourself grace and understanding that and progress is not linear. But as long as you're still trying, as long as you're still breathing, as long as you're still making an effort, you're going to be OK. But I would really suggest that you find a coach, um, not a celebrity coach, not someone you're just going to be number 3042 on their roster, but someone that you can actually develop a, um, a coaching relationship with uh, where they can help you navigate the inevitable problems you're going to face. Anyway. I just wish people would tell people too that like this is not the be all end all like this is not going to make you feel better about yourself if you're not there mentally Absolutely. like you have to be in a mental good mental space because even guests I've talked on here and this is my version myself uh, the reason I when I was in the best shape of my life like in my early 20s right during and after college I did it just because I thought it would make me feel better about myself and that it would make but it, it doesn't and I wish more people would tell it to people ahead of time like you have to get your mind fixed too because this is not going to solve you know internal problems that you know, you might have. Absolutely. I mean, look at bodybuilders, for example, you know, m most people are the most miserable and um, <laughs> self-deprecating when they look, look the best. So that's what I mean about finding a coach that can really talk to you when you're navigating these things and um, understanding why you're having a step back. You know, it, are you really, you know, having trouble with um, consistency or is there something you need to deal with? Yes. Well, and lastly, I love to talk about sleep because it's so undervalued by so many people and it's not talked about as much as it should be. To me, it's the most important thing in anyone's lifestyle. But obviously, when you're getting lean for a show like I myself, when I, you know, get ready to lose some of the summer weight ahead of time, like I, my sleep suffers as well. So I can't imagine what you guys go through. But how, uh, how much impact was there on your sleep schedule or were you already someone that like was a really good sleeper or a bad sleeper ahead of time? How is, how is your sleep been impacted throughout this lifestyle change? It was something I had to prioritize. You know, I really had to monitor my sleep hygiene and having a schedule, you know, every night. This is when we go to bed, you know, regardless. Um, making sure I had a little bit of fat before bed. And um, I like a product um, called Court Ease that helps with your cortisol before bed. And I also um, use some Delta 8 um, CBD um, from Calm Peak, which is another, another thing that helps me a lot. Um, but I really think developing consistent habits is the biggest thing with sleep. You can't be on your phone <laughs> all night, you know, guilty, you, you know, just things like that. Like the one thing that I tell my clients is to have a brain dump. So keep a journal or something beside, like beside their bed and just kind of, you know, write out your thoughts for the day, have a brain dump, have a regular schedule, you know, keeping your, some people use the blue light glasses, you know, whatever you need to do, but you're not going to lose fat if you're not sleeping. So that's one of the huge 
the huge things for me. I blame you bodybuilders in this podcast for making my sleep schedule even worse because here's the thing. Before I learned how to turn like notifications off on my phone, mm-hmm. I'm a night owl. Like I usually work late yeah. nights sometimes and I'd be going to bed at like 2 a.m. And then I'll get messages from you guys at like 4 or 5 in the morning responding to my Instagram stuff. And then I'm one of those people where once I get that, once I get up, like it's hard for me to go back to sleep. So, yeah, it's, I mean, more power. I also have business hours with my clients too. That was something I had to learn um, that, you know, after a certain time, you don't need to contact me. You know, you don't need to send me a message at 2 in the morning about um, can I swap you know, asparagus for, you know, cauliflower, you know, <laughs> I think that was something I really had to do was establish boundaries with my clients and honestly, my close friends and just let them know, Hey guys, I'm turning my phone off after, you know, 8 PM. So I just told my family and friends, unless you're dying, don't message yeah. me that like, that's like the, so yeah, that's, that's what I would say, you know, myself, but again, you know, Tracy, it was such a pleasure to have you on and share your <laughs> fitness journey with people. And I mean, I really appreciate it. I, It was so great talking to you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, everyone go and follow her Instagram page. I'll leave a link down below and, you know, buyer beware. You will get inspired to get off that couch and stop eating all those Twinkies, which, you know, more power to people if we're doing that myself. But again, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot signing off. Have a great day, everyone.